What, what up, DC Gang? It's your boy, Drew. And this your girl, Cash. Back with another video. Yes, we are. Yes, we, we are. We got Mr. Ballin. This must be the worst way to die. Top three places you can't go. Mm. You know we love them top three places you can't yes, go. All them we top love threes. the top threes. Crazy. So if y'all new, man, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Smack that bell so y'all know we dropping videos over here. Leave us comments what y'all want to see next down below in the comment section. Ready to get into it? Let's get into it. Let's go. Today, we're going to look at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways. But before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload mm -hmm. once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please sneak in to the like button's house in the middle of the night and burn several bags of microwave popcorn. Also, please mm. subscribe to our yeah. channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Burnt, okay, nice. let's get into today's stories. On February 15th, 2004, two police officers drove down a quiet street in a little English village called Murrow, and they pulled over in front of this little brick bungalow. Earlier that day, a neighbor who lived on the street had called the police to report hearing a strange digging sound coming from inside of this bungalow. And so these officers had been sent out to see what the sound was and make sure the occupants of this home were okay. Now, these two officers were not particularly worried about the occupants of this house. They assumed that some wild animal must have snuck in while the owners were away, and that was all this was. But, as they would quickly learn, that was not the case. After climbing out of their car, the two officers just stopped and listened for a second to see if they could hear this digging sound, but the bungalow was quiet, the street was quiet, and so the two officers shut their car doors and made their way up to the front porch of this bungalow and knocked on the front door. After a few moments, when nobody answered, one of the officers reached down and tried the handle and found it was unlocked. And so he opened the door just a crack and he called out through this opening in the door into the bungalow saying, hey, you know, it's police, we're here to check on you. But when no one called back to them, the officer opened the door the rest of the way uh -oh. and immediately both officers saw there was a huge problem inside of this house. The entire first floor was flooded with several inches of water, wow. and they could hear from somewhere in the back of the property the sound of running water. And so again, both officers called out into this house to try to get the attention of anyone who might be inside, and when again they were met with silence, the officers walked into the flooded house and began walking straight back towards this running water sound. And eventually, after walking through the living room, they entered this hallway that went right to the back of the property. And as soon as they were in it, they could see there was an open door at the end of the hallway on the left. And it seemed like the running water sound was coming out of that room. And so the two officers, one by one, sloshed down this hallway to this room. They turned left, looked inside, and what they saw completely shocked them and immediately sprung them into action. Two months before these officers came to this bungalow and found it flooded with water, the owner of this bungalow, 51-year-old Ronald McClagish, had broken up with his girlfriend. And this breakup was really hard on Ronald. He was already divorced, he was totally broke, he had loads of health issues like bad asthma, he had some liver oh. issues, Dang. and just generally he was someone who was kind of physically frail. And so this girlfriend had been one of the very few good things in his life, and now she was gone and he was alone again. And so very quickly after this breakup, Ronald fell into a very dark depression. Uh, and so for six weeks after they broke up, Ronald, for the most part, just stayed in bed and kind of moped around his bungalow, kind of feeling bad for himself. But then finally, at the end of those first six weeks after the breakup, mm. Ronald decided he wanted to get his life back together and just move on. So on February 1st, 2004, so roughly two weeks before those two officers would come to his bungalow because of this digging sound, Ronald would wake up feeling determined to start anew. And the first thing he was going to do was purge his bungalow of anything that was his ex-girlfriend's. She left a lot of things behind when they broke up. She had not collected them. Who are you thinking? I don't know. I don't know. You can't when did he flip out and right. go and do something to her? Kill her or... Yeah, like... 
Right. I don't know. We just, I'm just guessing mm-hmm. early, trying to put it together. I mean, you never know. Could do something to herself. That was his ex-girlfriends. She left a lot of things behind when they broke up. She had not collected them. And so now they were just kind of sources of pain. And where most of her stuff was inside of Ronald's bungalow was in this closet in one of the bedrooms at the end of the hall. So that morning, Ronald headed down the hall. He turned left into the bedroom. He opened up the closet. He went inside and with a trash bag in hand, he began rifling through everything in this closet and anything that was hers, he would take it and put it right into the trash bag. And at some point, when Ronald was almost done pulling the last few things of his girlfriend's out and into the trash bag, from behind him, he heard this strange sound coming from the bedroom. It sounded like wood bending or creaking, but before he could turn around to see what the sound was, Mm. the door to the closet he was in slammed shut with incredible force. And suddenly, Ronald was trapped inside of this closet in total darkness. Now, Ronald was likely shocked at first, but he would have reached and tried for the handle and found that no matter what he did, he could not open this closet again. And so Ronald began screaming for help and pounding on the door, but nobody came to help him. The closet that Ronald was in was fairly tall, but it was only two feet wide by about two feet deep, which meant Ronald could only stand inside of this closet. He couldn't sit down, he couldn't bend down. He literally was trapped standing. And Ronald didn't have water, he didn't have food. He knew that no one was going to be checking on him anytime soon. And even though his bungalow was kind of small and shabby, it was built out of brick. And so the likelihood that his calls for help were penetrating outside loud enough that people could hear them and that they would come in and rescue him was pretty slim. And so at some point that evening, Ronald realized he needed to do something different if he was going to get out of this closet. And so above him were a series of pipes across the ceiling. And so he reached up and he grabbed one of them and he broke it off. He was likely thinking that with this pipe, maybe he can throw up. This story remind me of the lady that got stuck in that closet too, and, and she pulled pipe. a no pipe. water came up. Yep. Oh wow. So Mention we can't see you just pulling for something. Man. Yeah, because your what instinct is trying. Good. You want to get out. Yeah. And he mm-hmm. broke it off. He was likely thinking that with this pipe, maybe he can burrow a hole in the wall and crawl through to another room, or maybe he can punch a hole in the door and somehow unlock it, or at a minimum, with the metal pipe, smashing it against the wall or the door would be louder than any noise he could make by yelling. However, the second he broke that pipe off the ceiling, something horrible happened. The pipe he broke was a water pipe. And as soon as it was broken, icy cold water began pouring down directly on top of Ronald's head and face. And again, because he can only stand basically in the middle of this closet, he couldn't get out of the way of this water. It was like he was under a waterfall and couldn't go anywhere. And so he likely tried to ignore the water and tried to use the pipe and screamed and do anything he could to get someone to know he was in here, but no one could hear him. And so it was like he was being tortured with this freezing water exactly. and he's in this tight claustrophobic space it's total darkness and he's totally panicking and for days and days that would be Ronald's nightmarish reality but despite how terrible his circumstances were Ronald continued to use that pipe to both smash the walls to make loud sounds. He also began burrowing into the walls, trying to make a hole. But Ronald was getting weaker and weaker. He became very sick. And also, because the water was constantly hitting his head and face, his skin got so saturated that literally his skin started falling off. It basically Ooh. opened up into these sores and began to sag, and the water just began brushing his skin off. And so finally, after about a week of being trapped in this closet in these terrible conditions, Ronald realized help was not going to come in time. And so he put his pipe down, he kind of slumped up against the wall, and then closed his eyes. Ronald's neighbor, who called the police, actually did hear Ronald using that pipe to try to dig a hole in his wall. And she heard Ronald smashing the pipe on his door. And she must have heard muffled shrieks and yells but she didn't know what they were and kind of just decided it wasn't her business. But when Ronald's house went from all these strange sounds to silence, that was when she called the police and said, hey, I heard some digging sounds coming from the bungalow and now I don't. 
And so when those two police officers arrived at Ronald's so bungalow, they them. went inside, they went down the hallway, they went into the bedroom where Ronald had gone, and they saw this huge wardrobe, which is a big wooden piece of furniture, toppled over right in front of the closet. And at the bottom of the closet, they saw two human feet protruding from underneath that little space at the mm. bottom of the closet. Those feet belonged to Ronald. He had managed to force his feet underneath the closet, but of course, he could not have fit Dang. underneath the closet door. And so the two police officers rushed over, and together, they barely were able to get this wardrobe off of the closet door. And when they opened the door up, Ronald was in there, he was deceased, his body was still in a standing position, kind of rigid and propped up against the wall, and freezing water was still pouring down onto his head. It would turn that out no one had intentionally mm -hmm. trapped Ronald. Instead, mm. his wardrobe was just unstable, and it happened to topple over at the closet. worst possible mm. moment. That story is so similar to that lady story who got trapped in her, um, her it was a bungalow or a cabin or something. Something like that. When her friends supposed to go with her. Her friends were supposed to go with her, but she ended up going by herself. Got stuck in the closet. And got stuck in the closet. The the came off. Yeah, and people was hearing her beating on the uh, wall, just nothing. trying to. Didn't but they didn't say nothing until after they after the noise stopped. Just Why do like we wait till it's over with? So as long as it's keep going, it's right. fine. Because you never know what it is. Cause like if you hear something like beating or scratching on the wall. I think you just go ahead and call because you just never know. It's, too, it's like know. too much stories like this happening. Fast too. Yeah, Every that's day. sad though. Like you know, like it's, it's like final destination. Final destination. Like You're something pushed it. the wooden stuff over, and for him to get caught up, in, you know, trapped in the closet. No space. No space. Him to taking that pipe off and you know trying to get out. Like anybody natural react, you know. Yeah. That is crazy, go. man. Sad. And then nobody called. It's, on Thanksgiving morning in 1900, an 18-year-old named Thomas Pedler told his mother that he was going out for a bit, but he'd be back in time for turkey that afternoon, and then he grabbed his jacket and his coat, and he headed out the door. Thomas lived in a very working-class neighborhood in San Francisco, California, where, generally speaking, nothing big really ever happened. It was kind of a place where people just worked, and that was it. But on this day, something huge was happening in Thomas's neighborhood. The big football game between Stanford University and the University of California was taking place at the stadium in Thomas's district, and they were expecting over 20,000 people to cram into this stadium. And so Thomas was not about to miss this incredible spectacle, even though he didn't have enough money to buy a ticket. But he knew he would find a way to watch this game. And so Thomas leaves his house and he runs to the stadium, which was not far from his house, and he waited in front of the front gate where all these people are streaming in to go into the stadium. And around 11 a.m., Thomas's very close friend, Charles, who was also a young man, made his way to the front gate. The two met up. And at first, their plan was to try to sneak in with the horde of people that were making their way into the stadium. But even though they were still hours away from the opening kickoff of this big game, it was at 2.30 p.m., the stadium was packed. I mean, there was nowhere to sit, there was nowhere to stand. People that had tickets who were going in are looking around thinking, you know, where are we going to watch this game? And so Thomas and Charles are kind of like, well, what's the point of sneaking in if there's nowhere to watch? And so they decided, okay, we need to find another way to watch this game. And so they began looking around, and they noticed there was a huge fence that lined the perimeter of this stadium. And they saw there were some people kind of climbed up on this fence trying to get a view down onto the field. And pretty quickly, when Thomas and Charles decided they would try to do that too, they saw that all the good spots on this fence were already taken. The spots that were open provided no view onto the field. And so that option as well didn't work. And so Thomas and Charles are frustrated. They're starting to worry that they will not see this big about game. To do crazy. But when they walked back over to the front gates of the stadium, they happened to notice across the street was this group of people rushing over to this big white brick factory building. And and they were literally placing ladders up against the sides of That's this building so and beginning to climb up it. I mean, this is a five-story building, and they are just basically free climbing the windows and the fire escapes. And Thomas and Charles realized that the top of this factory was flat and provided a perfect view down onto the field. And so all these people 
they're trying to get a good seat to watch this game. And so without any hesitation, mm. Thomas and Charles decide oh. they're going to do that too. So they left the stadium, they ran across the street, and they began climbing up the ladders and climbing the windows and the fire escapes until finally they made it onto the roof, 55 feet off the ground. And when they got up there, there wasn't that many people. And so Thomas and Charles were able to run right over to the front edge of this building and claim a spot with an absolutely perfect view of the game. A couple of hours later, at 2.30 p.m., when the game actually started, the rooftop that Thomas and Charles were on was now completely packed with people. Hundreds of people have climbed up onto this factory. There were some factory workers down below telling people, do not do this, do not climb on top of this factory, it's not safe. But nobody listened to them, and the police either didn't notice this was happening, or they didn't care. What? And so there's all these people that are on this roof, they're all super excited, and the game has begun, it's 2.30, and as soon as the game started, it was like the crowd in the stadium, which could be heard very easily from this rooftop, just kind of erupted, and there were all these bands playing in the stadium, I mean, it was chaos down below, and it really caught on on the roof. All these guys, including Thomas and Charles, they're getting amped about this game, they're singing, yeah, yeah. they're chanting, they're screaming, they're yelling. I mean, it's total chaos, and Thomas and Charles loved it. But about 20 minutes into the game, as Thomas and Charles are enjoying themselves and the crowd is still going wild, a dull cracking sound could be heard coming from one side of this roof. And so Thomas and Charles, they kind of spun around to see where this cracking sound had come from. And when they began looking out across the sea of people, they noticed on the far side of the roof where the sound had kind of come from, they could see people scrambling to get off the roof. But before Thomas and Charles and the other people around them who were watching this happening could figure out what was going on, there was a much louder cracking sound and suddenly the floor underneath Thomas Charles and everybody else collapsed. No. It, immediately, no. people on this roof fell all the way to the bottom of this factory, oh, 55 oh, feet wow. low. There weren't loads of floors inside of this factory. Instead, it was basically just one big building, 55 feet high, that housed this brick structure right in the center of the factory that was almost as tall as the entire factory. It was almost like the factory was a shell yeah. around this brick smaller structure right in the middle that was like 40 feet tall. And so after the ceiling collapses, Thomas, he falls, but miraculously, he lands on a wooden beam that stretched across the entire factory, like a support beam, and he grabbed onto it, saving himself from falling all the way down. And so Thomas, he only fell maybe five feet, so he was okay, but he didn't have a great grip on this beam. He was holding on, but just barely. And so Thomas, he turns and he's looking around at what's happened below him and he's hearing people screaming and he's hearing the sounds of people running around trying to help those who have hit the ground on the bottom. And Thomas immediately begins scanning for Charles and he finds him. Charles was one of the other fairly lucky people, at least in Thomas's mind, Charles seemed lucky because instead of falling from the roof all the way to the ground, Charles and 15 or 20 other people had fallen right onto that brick structure that kind of made up the main part of this factory. Yeah. And so Charles had only fallen maybe 10 or 15 feet onto the structure. And so Thomas is thinking, oh, Charles and these other people, they've survived this fall, they're okay. However, the second Charles and the others, who supposedly were saved mm -hmm. by landing on this brick structure, the second they hit, <sighs> That brick structure, despite not suffering catastrophic injuries like broken bones and horrible internal injuries, these people on the brick structure began letting out these primal screams, these just horrible blood-curdling screams, and as they did, these loud popping sounds began coming out of their body, what, and then their bodies that? began contorting forward, almost like a bug rolling up onto itself. It would turn out this factory was not a normal factory. What? This was a glass factory, and in order to make glass, you need to heat sand and some other chemicals Ooh. up to extraordinarily high temperatures. You need a furnace that can literally burn hotter than lava. And so that brick structure oh. that was housed in the middle of this five-story tall factory was a glass furnace, and it was on. 
And so even though the inside of this furnace was the hottest place, it was over 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, the outside of this furnace, where Charles and the others had landed, believing they were saved from this 55-foot fall to their death, was still extremely hot, so hot, that the factory workers couldn't even go near the furnace, even with special equipment on. The way they worked with this furnace was with these long metal pokers. They would Boy. work the flames and the glass at a distance. And so the instant that Charles and the others landed on the top of this furnace, they began to light on fire. Those snapping oh. sounds that were coming out oh. of their bodies was the sound of them instantly igniting on fire. And so Thomas and the others who had initially survived this horrible collapse mm. watched as Charles and the others shrieked and shrieked and their bodies continued to That's contort torture. and they continued to burn and smolder. And Charles actually, he would roll up so tightly that his body began to roll down the curved side of this furnace and at some point his body slipped into a crack in the furnace and he actually fell into the flames inside at which point he went silent. Around the time that Charles and the others stopped shrieking, a number of people just out on the road heard the commotion and they came inside and one of them was Thomas's father and in a terrible twist of fate he actually looked up and saw his son clinging to the beam, wow. Thomas. Except it was so hot inside of this factory that Thomas was sweating, he was losing his grip, it was really hard to hold on to this beam. And his father watched as Thomas lost his grip and fell the 10 more feet down onto the furnace exterior. He landed Ooh. feet first, then he fell onto his stomach and his face oh. immediately ignited on fire, began shrieking, and then went silent. All told, 23 people would be killed wow. during this roof collapse, and dozens and dozens more would be horribly injured okay. and disfigured. Mm -hmm. This collapse goes down as one of the very worst disasters in sports history. However, on this day, the crowd inside the stadium was so caught up in the game that they actually didn't notice this horrible tragedy so taking place just 100 feet away from where they were. It wasn't until the end of the game when the winning team's fans carried their players in this kind of spontaneous parade out of the stadium to celebrate that they walked out onto the street and saw all these burnt up, rolled up corpses of the people who had landed on the furnace. Boy. Well, yeah, I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, for, they, for they, a game. For, yeah, they all went on the roof, but they said some people were trying to stop them, telling them it's not safe. But the, the cops didn't do that. They said either the cops didn't see them or they just didn't care. I think the cops probably didn't I, care. I don't think. I'm sure the cops probably seen them. I'm pretty sure. The, I don't know. But that's crazy. And then how he said a uh, man came in and watched his son fall from that's, the... Um, that's coincidence how he happened to... He, he looked right and saw and, and see son. your son. That, that's... That's tragic, yeah. man. That's sad, for real. A lot of people lost their life. Yeah, just because mm. we want to watch the game. I can't imagine that. And then the people come out of the stadium to see that. To see that, because they said they didn't even they notice what's going on because it was they had they was doing anything over. The, you know, the game was going on until after they started putting the people in the air, and then when they walked by, that's when they saw it. Oh, oh man. man, tragic. Yeah, that's. Let us know how y'all feel about that, that one down below. Great. That was a. For real. Yeah. In April of 1979, a 69-year-old woman named Monica Myers was appointed mayor of a little village called Betterton in the U.S. state of Maryland. Betterton used to be this very fancy resort town on the water where people from Baltimore and Philadelphia would come there for vacations. They had fancy hotels and restaurants and shops. But by the time Monica became Betterton's mayor, Betterton had kind of gone downhill. People had stopped coming to Betterton. All the hotels shut down or were abandoned or burned down. The summer homes of the rich people from the big cities, those got sold off. And down at the beach, all these glamorous boardwalks literally just kind of crumbled into the sea. And in their place were all these shanty towns where homeless people set up their camps. But Monica had grown up in Betterton, and so she really loved the town and wanted to improve it. 
And so when she became mayor in 1979, she really leaned into her new role way more than other mayors would. Instead of managing the village from an office, like most mayors would do, Monica literally went out in town and just began doing lots of jobs around the town for free. She would ride around with the police and literally stop crimes in action. One time, she stumbled across someone looting a vacant hotel, and she personally got out, chased this person down, and made them put everything back that they had taken. She would pick up trash on the beach, she would do random repairs on people's homes and businesses all over town, and sometimes she would just go door to door asking people how they were doing. And so very quickly, the people of Betterton really grew to love Monica, and they loved seeing her every single day just out and about making Betterton a better place. And so, on March 20th, 1980, roughly one year into Monica's tenure as mayor, it was immediately noticeable to the people of Betterton when Monica was nowhere to be seen. That day, she did not go to the police station in the morning like mm. she normally did. She was not seen at the beach doing her trash pickup, and she didn't knock on anybody's door. And so by mid-morning that day, the people of Betterton, all 120 of them, were basically out in force looking for Monica. And at 11.30 a.m., the police in Betterton got a call about Monica. It was this guy who was totally panicked, he could barely make a sentence, and he basically just told the police, you gotta get here now, and so the police hopped in their cars, and they sped to the address this guy gave them, and when they got there, they saw it was this very plain, boxy building that was kind of tucked back in the woods, it was far away from the town center, and really, nobody ever went over here, and the police, when they parked their cars, they saw the guy who had called the police, the distraught caller, was standing outside of the front door, he was obviously crying, and he was waving for them to come over and follow him into this building. And so the police got out of their cars, they ran over to this guy, and they're asking him, you know, what happened? Where's Monica? What's going on? But this guy was so hysterical, he really could not describe what happened to Monica. He just kept telling them to come on, come on, follow me. And so he led them into this building, and pretty quickly they entered this huge warehouse where all across the ceiling were these big metal catwalk areas that kind of zigged and zagged all over this warehouse, and below them, all over the floor, were these huge industrial-sized 15-foot tall vats that contained something. And so this guy who had led police here, he stops and he just points at the nearest vat. And so the police, picking up his cue, begin walking towards this vat. And as they got closer and closer, they were hit with this horrible smell that made them gag and cough. And before long, they had to stop and kind of compose themselves. The smell was so bad. It would turn out this building that was kind of removed from the town center of Betterton was Betterton's sewage treatment plant. And that morning, Monica had gone to the treatment plant to help clean some of these 15-foot-tall industrial-sized vats that contained human waste. She had done this enough times that when she was here, she did not need any supervision. And so that morning, she was alone, she climbed up onto one of the catwalks so over one of these big cool. vats, and she had reached down with her testing kit to test the sewage to see how much cleaning it would need. And as she did that, she somehow slipped and fell into the big vat of human be. waste. Ooh. Now, she would not have immediately gone under. It was not like a liquid. It was more like clay or really thick mud, where at first, she would have kind of been laying on top of the sewage. But as soon as she tried to move to get out of the sewage, the sewage would have functioned more like quicksand, where as soon as a part of her body went under the surface, it would not come up again. And so, after the police composed themselves, they climbed up onto the catwalk, and they looked down, and they saw Monica, who was face down, partially submerged inside of the spat, and she was deceased. Mm. Her autopsy would reveal that she died of drowning, which means she literally inhaled human waste. Ooh. Dang. That's one of the worst ways right there. That Ooh. one and the second one. Yeah. Yeah, that was crazy. Yeah, that. Number three, with her last one. And the second one. I mean, all of them very tragic. Yeah, all of them. That's terrible, torture ways to go. Terrible ways to, to die. And like the lady, like the last one, she was so loving and helpful and doing things like, I never said, she was a mayor, right? Yeah. 
and going on knocking on people's doors or just asking them, them doing things. Ask them how are you, how are you doing, doing and stuff that. like that. You ain't nobody really doing that nowadays. Mm-hmm. I mean, she was just so like a wonderful person and for her to go and out of her way to go in these sewage places and, and help it clean somebody, and help clean that um sewage out. Because, like I said, she normally, that's what she normally do. She go by herself, so she had, like, a routine. But she ended up slipping and falling, and nobody was there to help. So, that, that, mm-hmm. that's sad. That, that one, that one that and one that third you. one. That one hits you, yeah. yeah. I mean, the second, the second one and the third one. one. I mean, all of them hit all me. All of them were, but that, that last one. Because the, the one. first guy, he had so much, you know, going on with him from his liver. He was frail, and... Um, what else he was going on? Oh, basically a lot going on with him, and he just got out of a, a relationship, and he was turned. He mm-hmm. he got depressed, and everybody take things differently. Yeah, and then that happened. He got stuck in the closet. The his uh, wooden dresser or whatever that was ended up falling in front of the the door, and he and got trapped inside. Can't even get out. So it's like I all the video. I mean, all the stories got to me. I mean, every 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 story got to me. I, and like I said, the worst way to die, that, that's definitely the worst way to die, yeah, especially the second and the third one. Yep. That second one with them falling from the ceiling and onto that um that thing where Mr. Baldwin was talking about, where it was so hot until they oh, yeah. body suck a tour and then yeah, so and popping and, and, oh, yeah. That heat. Mm. Oof. Y'all let from us know the how father, y'all feel. Seeing his son falling down and, and falling on that face fur- on the furnace. Oh, man, yeah. Let us know down below yeah. which videos and order got y'all. Because those, like we said, all three of them. All three. Dead, so. All three was, was tragic. Terrible ways. Terrible ways. Make sure y'all also go check out Mr. Ballin's page. If y'all haven't already, and check out his videos. Other than that, y'all say we'll catch y'all next one. Catch y'all next one.